Hi, I'm Shannon Farrell with the OSU Department of Ag Economics, and in this video, in the Farm Transitions video series, we're going to talk about thinking through your will. Now, we could have a week-long video series that was about nothing but how to draft a will, but we hope that you take the time to find a good, experienced estate planning attorney to help you through that process. What we're going to talk about in this video are the things that you need to think about in preparation for working with your attorney to get that will in place. Now, the first thing that you need to do, like we talked about with the overall series, is figuring out an inventory. Where are you at right now? Well, the same thing holds true for your will. Now, even though your will is just one piece of your estate plan, and your estate plan is just one piece of your transition plan, you still need an inventory for the purposes of your will as well. Now, one thing you're going to inventory with your will, oddly enough, is people. Who are the people in your family? Who do you want to receive some of your assets after you've passed away? Now, that can include people both now and in the future. For example, what if you set up your will now, but a child's born later, or perhaps you have grandchildren in your will now, but there might be additional grandchildren before you modify the will? Are you going to have a will that's flexible enough to allow additional people to enter those kinds of classifications? We obviously need to inventory our property, both the real property and the personal property. Not just tangible property, but also intangible property, things like investments or intellectual property if we have it. Also, you need to understand that when we're talking about personal property, little things can be really important. We've seen big fights over things like engagement rings and quilts, collectibles, versus people that have given up claims to assets that were worth tens of thousands of dollars. So your tangible, personable property might actually be really important to this process as well. Now, you also need to think about places. Where are you going to keep these important documents and these items that are going to be given away? It's really important that you keep things like your will, but also your inventory, your list of accounts, all those sorts of important documents updated and together so that you don't make your heirs go on a scavenger hunt as they're trying to implement your estate plan and your will. Now, Probably one of the first things you need to think about with your will is who's going to be the executor. And remember the executor is just the person that represents the estate. Obviously a will can't implement itself, so you need to have somebody who can actually go about implementing the provisions of the will. This is also going to be the person that's interacting with the probate attorney and with the probate court. So make sure you understand this person has a pretty big job. In addition to representing the estate and being interacting in a state of interaction with the judge and with the attorneys, they're also in charge of maintaining the estate. Now, what that means is they need to understand how to maintain the estate. So if we're talking about a farm or ranch, your executor needs to understand how to manage a farm or ranch because the probate process is likely going to take some time usually months, in many cases years, and they need to be able to keep that ranch or farm running during the time that the probate is ongoing. So they need to have the know-how necessary for that asset base. And are they familiar with the assets that are involved? They may know how to run a farm. Do they have the know-how to run your farm? That's crucial as well. So if you choose someone to be your executor, make sure that they're familiar enough with your operation that they can pick it up and run with it on relatively short notice because that's what they'll be called upon to do. Another thing to remember about your executor is that they have a legal classification that we call fiduciary, which sounds like a big scrabble word, but what a fiduciary means is that they're held to the absolute highest standard of care. Their duty is to make sure that the heirs of the estate are treated as they're supposed to be, even if that means sacrificing their own interests. So being a fiduciary means that they're going to be under a lot of scrutiny by the other heirs of the estate, and that's something that you really need to consider. Now, under Oklahoma law, the executor by default is supposed to provide a bond. In other words, they're supposed to provide some sort of financial security that other people can rely on in case they don't follow through with their fiduciary duties. Now, that can be an administrative hassle. It can also be expensive for your executor. So what many people do in their will is waive the statutory bond requirement. You can choose to do that or you can choose to leave the requirement in place. But kind of along with that same sort of consideration, do you want to compensate your executor? Again, you've given the executor a big, difficult job that may seriously eat into the other responsibilities that they have. It may be thoughtful to provide some sort of compensation to the executor. If you do that, understand that compensation is also going to be scrutinized by those other heirs. So make sure you think it through, be very careful about it, and make sure that it's very well documented in your will. 
Now, as we talk about executor, it may be important for you to establish what we call successor executors. All that means is you've created one executor, but you've also created a list so that if that executor can't or is just simply unable or unwilling to fulfill their duties, another executor can step up to take their place. Lots of times we may name a surviving spouse as our executor, but what happens if there's an accident and our, our, our spouse is also killed along with us? Now we're left without an executor again. So you may want to consider having successor executors in case one executor just can't or is unable or unwilling to fulfill their job. But another thing we have to think about are co-executors. Many times people name their children as co-executors because they don't want to treat any one child different from the others. Now, while that may be a laudable goal, it can also really create some complications because if we have co-executors, we have to have some sort of mechanism for resolving conflicts. What if those executors can't agree on how to handle a particular decision that they're faced with in carrying out the affairs of the estate? That can freeze up the estate for some time. Also, if we're going to have multiple executors, are they all going to do the same thing or are we going to divide up the responsibilities? This can all get complicated really fast. Lots of times having co-executors can actually make the implementation of the state more of a challenge than it needs to be. Successor executors are often a good idea. Co-executors can cause some real challenges. Now if your family has a lot of emotional stress or if there's lots of really difficult family dynamics involved, it may be worth considering somebody outside the family to be an executor. Just know that when we do that, it's very customary to provide that executor with some form of compensation because they're really kind of doing this as a service to the other family members. Now, let's talk about guardianship for minor children. Now, we can have a standalone document that we call a guardian nomination, but we can also incorporate that into our will. And if we've got children under the age of 18, it's probably really important that either as a separate document or as part of the will, we do include that guardian nomination because otherwise, we leave the selection of a nomination to the courts, which is likely to cause some significant stress to the surviving family members, and nobody really needs that. Now, if you've got a will and you have a guardian nomination for your children in your will, and your spouse has done the same thing, it's really important to make sure that those provisions mirror each other because you don't want to set up conflicting nominations. That'll make things difficult for the survivors as well. If you're going to provide a nomination for someone outside the family to provide for the care of your children, do you want to provide some resources of your estate to support the children as well? And if your kids have special needs or a persistent medical condition, you might also want to consider a special needs trust established for that child as part of your will to support the needs for those kids as they go on. Now, understand that if we give kids property that are under the age of 18, they're going to receive that property as soon as they become 18. It may be that you don't want your children to receive the property when they're 18. You may want to delay it a little bit, perhaps to when they're 21, when they graduate from college, some older age, etc., etc. In order to do that, what you're probably going to need to do is establish a testamentary trust. In other words, if you have specific property that you want your children to receive and you want them to receive it at a later point in time, the trust will spring up in the probate process and the trust will hold on to that property until the specified age. Now let's talk about who receives real property under the provisions of our will. First off, we need to understand if we have title solely in ourselves right now or if that title may be jointly held by our spouse or somebody else. If the property is held jointly with someone else, we need to coordinate very carefully with that other person to understand how our interest is going to be transferred. For example, if we hold property as a joint tenant with someone else, say our spouse, our will can't convey that property. It just simply doesn't have the legal power to do so. The joint tenancy is going to transfer that property. So make sure we understand the title to the property that we intend to transfer our, by our will and make sure we actually have the power to do so. Now, if we're going to transfer property in our will to multiple parties simultaneously, in other words, we're going to create a co-tenancy, what kind of co-tenancy do we want to create? We can create a joint tenancy, for example, and in a joint tenancy, whenever one of the joint tenants passes away, their interest is redistributed amongst the other surviving joint tenants. So let's say, for example, we have two children. We convey property to those children as joint tenants. The first of those children to die will see their interest transferred to the remaining child. That's how joint tenancy works. Now we also have what we call tenancy in common. 
tenancy in common just transfers equal shares, sometimes even unequal shares, to multiple parties simultaneously. But whenever one of those tenants passes away, their interest doesn't get redistributed to the other tenants. They can each individually transfer their interests however they want. How long do we want the parties to hold on to this property? If we want the people to have their property for as long as they survive, we can create what we call a life estate. Many times, for example, in a will, a spouse will give a piece of property to the surviving spouse in a life estate. The surviving spouse gets to keep the property for as long as they're alive, and then when they pass away, the property goes to a designated party called a remainderman, and they get to have the property outright. Now, that's one way that we can approach that. But another thing that we could do is also, like we mentioned in the case of minor children, create what we call a testamentary trust. We create a trust in our will. The will conveys the property to that trust, and then the trust holds on to that property for the specified period of time. Now, there are lots of things that we can talk about with respect to trusts. We'll be addressing those in another video as part of this series. The last thing to think about is if we're conveying property to anybody, are we going to attach any strings? Lots of times people would like to say, boy, I want my kids to have this land, but only if they keep farming it. Or I want my kids to have this farm, and I never want them to be able to sell it. That's really difficult to do in any sort of enforceable way with a will. Because as we talked about in another video, wills do their job, and then when probate's over, the will goes away. It's really difficult to create restrictions on property through a will, and it's really difficult to enforce them. So a trust might be the better choice if that's really what you're concerned about. Now let's talk about personal property. When we talk about personal property, as we mentioned before, there are lots of family conflicts uh, about personal property, and it's usually because there's some sort of emotional connection with some specific item that someone really would like to receive as part of the estate's administration. If we're going to give specific items to specific people, we need to include specific instructions about that in the will. It's not enough that we told one of our children that we want them to have this item when we die. An oral statement like that is going to have no legal effect whatsoever. We've got to include those specific instructions as part of the will. And what many people do is record a letter allocating those specific items of property and then using what we call a will codicil, incorporate that letter by reference into the will so that it becomes part of the will. And your attorney can instruct you about how to do that. Some people don't really have specific allocations for items of personal property, but instead they just want their kids or their heirs to go through their personal property and select which items they want. If you want to do that, that's okay, but just make sure that you establish a procedure so that everyone knows the rules of that process. And remember, any of the things we talk about when we're allocating this personal property, again, have to be in writing to be enforceable. Now, one thing we often don't consider is if we die owing any debts. And how are those debts going to be paid? Okay. First off, if we say nothing in our will about how to allocate our property to pay those debts, there's a statute in Oklahoma and virtually every other state as well that has a sequence for how we go through your property to pay off those debts. But you may not want that sequence to be followed. And if that's the case, you need to specify in your will what procedure you want the executor to go through in actually paying off those debts. So one thing you can do, if you choose to do so, is select specific property that you're willing to sell or liquidate to pay off those debts. For example, life insurance or retirement accounts are frequently used for this kind of thing. Do you have a provision in your will that says, though, if that specific asset isn't enough, what assets come next? What happens if that property is not enough to cover all of your debts? If that's the case, you may want to set a priority system to say, this class of asset goes first, then this, and then this. Also, it's important for you to play some what-if games. How do you go about determining how you're going to impact specific gifts of property? Let's say, for example, that we chose one child to receive this specific piece of property, but it turns out that piece of property needs to at least be partially liquidated or completely liquidated to pay off those debts. How are we going to go about resolving that situation? Those are all things that you can address in the course of your will. And speaking of what-if scenarios, it's important to sit down and just play as many what-if scenarios as you can to determine how you'd like your will to handle those scenarios. What if someone receiving property under your will passes away before you do? Who else would you like to receive that property? What if someone's left out? 
And usually we don't leave people out of our will because we just forgot about them, but rather it's because someone popped into the will. For example, if we give a gift to our grandchildren, what if another grandchild pops up after the will's executed? Have we made a provision to include that new grandchild into the process? Do we have provisions that address what happens if someone gets married or someone gets divorced? Um, what if a specific item that we meant to give to someone is destroyed or lost or sold? What happens then? With any sort of will, it's really important to have some catch-all provisions to basically say if any item of property hasn't been addressed in this will, it will be handled in this way. That's to avoid any of those assets have to go, having to go through the intestate succession process that we've talked about in other videos. Also, lots of people that create a trust and use the trust as their primary estate planning vehicle often forget that there may be property they didn't transfer into the trust. That property, again, falls into the intestate succession process if we're not careful. So even if you've got a trust, a pour over will, which basically rounds up any property that you haven't already put into the trust and then places it into the trust is an important provision for you to have. Now, once you've gone through this process, you'll know that in this video series, we've talked about the importance of communication. It's no less important here. Remember to talk about the provisions of your will with your family because you might learn some things. You might be giving a piece of property to someone who just doesn't have the willingness to maintain it or doesn't want it or might want a different piece of property. Um, you may find that there are lots of surprises you don't know about, but talking about those surprises in advance can be really important. At the same time, talking to your kids about what you intend to do or your surviving spouse with what you intend to do can avoid surprises on their part. And from experience, we know that avoiding surprises gives us the opportunity to minimize conflict and more importantly, minimize contests of our will. Last, but again, certainly not least, it's important to pre prepare your family members, your heirs, for whatever their new roles are going to be in carrying out the will, especially your executor, because like we said, the executor has a tough job that's very demanding. Well, what have we talked about in this video? We've talked about the importance of having an inventory before you start off with your will planning process. We talked about the importance of thinking who your executor is, who's going to take care of any minor children that you have, what your real and personal property are and where they're going to go, understanding how you're going to pay any debts that may remain for your estate, dealing with the unexpected and talking these provisions through with your family. Now we talked about a lot of stuff, obviously very quickly in this very short video, but if you ever need to go back for more reference materials or to look at any of the references or other support materials we've provided as part of this project, just go to agecon.okstate.edu slash farm transitions and our entire library is there. I'm Shannon Farrell with the OSU Ag Econ Department. Thank you for watching.